it's a high place. Not towering, but cool and crystal clear. Victoria's Central Highlands. Only 100 kilometers to the west of Melbourne, yet remote and sparsely populated. And even in midsummer, with nothing between them and the far distant Antarctic, likely to turn chilly or upland cold on a sunny day. And here is reputedly Victoria's biggest tree. Not the tallest, but the largest, 14 metres in circumference. Try getting your arms around that, and 27 metres tall. Burke and Wills camp beneath it, cheerfully, on their way north. Today, the old tree, hundreds of years older than Victoria, is only a stone's throw from Delmenico's pub in the tiny mountain hamlet of Guildford. <laughs> We'll be back later because there's a connection between the two, the tree and intruders with names like Delmenico, an encounter which goes back to the days of the gold rush when sleepy little hamlets like Guildford were roaring towns before the road again became a long, solitary track across the highlands, silent and seldom travelled. But something special happened in this place long ago, then and now. It was many, many thousands of years ago, yet not so long ago. Here, the volcanoes roared when the land was in turmoil. 300,000 years passed. They spewed forth incandescent rocks and rivers of lava without sheen. Molten lakes made dull by a sunless sky. A sky shrouded for decades by the smoke of their furnaces. Three giants erupting, ignited by unbelievable temperatures in the pits of the earth. The volcanoes roared. And then one day, the fires went out. The furnaces silent, the shaken land began to heal itself. Little ice ages smoothed the tumult, and the scars of the warring mountains and the towering, blazing landscape of prehistory subsided, bathed by the warmth of a gentler sun, nursed by an easier climate. And the tallest and mightiest of the three warring volcanoes is now Mount Franklin. From the chaos of ages, tranquility. The old mountain is very, very old, shrunken like a stooped old man. But make no mistake about its past, its volcanic rim remains razor sharp. Its dark crater is eerie, cool and silent. It only reflects an overhead sun. Curiously, there's an angry feel about the place. The ground is sullen. There are strange echoes. Even on the gentlest day, something haunting. It's always autumn here. It's better above, on the summit, not just looking down, but out. On a clear day, you can see well, not forever, but certainly the other mountain tops of the Central Highlands. What it all means is that we're a thousand or so metres above sea level. But the long-spent violence that forged these highlands has driven chasms and gorges through them and endowed them with not only charm, but mystery and just a touch, perhaps, 
of magic. There to the east is Mount Macedon, and you can't see it from here, Hanging Rock. Another volcano, hanging rock spearing up from the plain. It's a mamelon or volcanic plug, the last stump of an eruption, said to be the best example of a mamelon anywhere in the world. Just 100 meters tall. But how deep is it? No one's sure. The steep sided escarpments end in sheer drops or gargoyles of twisted and jumbled stones broken and pitted by dark moors, yawning, echoless mouths. How deep do they go? No one is sure, perhaps to the pits of hell. The word most used is bottomless. There's no question it is a strange place. It's no surprise that it sees Joan Lindsay's imagination. There's a stillness about it, a silence, a sense of something different. But alone and by oneself, it seems real enough that the event she described on that long ago St. Valentine's Day might actually have taken place. But you can't demystify an ominous pillar and centuries of uneasy sounds. A grey twilight pillar of stone, which seems only to lead to the impenetrable blackness of the centre of the earth. The hub of Victoria's central highlands is crisscrossed by watercourses, long and short. Mostly they flow north, into the Loddon and Goulburn rivers and on into the Murray. They cascade over waterfalls, Trentham, Sailors and the Loddon Falls. They slice through gorges and dense eucalypt forests and, where the volcanoes roared, they go underground, boring through long dead volcanic arteries, choked with a thick crust of minerals. They bubble and seep back to the surface, saturated with metal, to make Dalesford and Hepburn Springs the spa and mineral water centre of Australia.
At Central Springs, there are three pumps alongside each other, and they each produce a different type of mineral water. But this whole region is dotted with pumps, scores of them. Here is 80% of Australia's mineral water. Some is even exported to Europe. There's a mixture of 11 minerals in the waters, also injected with natural gases, still trapped in the rock and underground basins because of the volcanic upheavals. Mineral water springs from the ground in the quietest places. The old pump house, now restored, as its setting has been regreened, shelters modern machinery that pipes the water uphill into holding tanks for collection and transportation to Melbourne for bottling. Each public spring has a name and usually a distinctive mineral property. Locarno Spring yields iron-enriched water. Soda Spring, mainly lime. Wayuna is heavy with magnesium and sulphur spring, naturally enough, sulphur. The water was first bottled commercially as far back as 1850. There was a ready market. Some eager early visitors drank as much as 15 to 20 pints a day. The first building erected in Hepburn was a bottling works, just as there's one today. Cadbury Sweeps agree that it was a good idea then and still is. So some of the familiar labels you see on the supermarket shelves are not brainstorm names dreamed up by an advertising agency. For years, I thought Mount Franklin was as fictitious as the giant fist that drove a bottle through it. Ever tasted Mount Franklin, fresh from the heart of the mountain. So given an endless fountain of perhaps the finest mineral water in the world, they built a bathhouse at the turn of the century. In those days, they tried to make a barden barden of it. The pavilion was designed in Queen Anne style, and the lawns and footbridge were laid out for people to promenade or to listen to music in the park. Brawns, sulkies and fallen hands waited to take the guests back to their boarding houses. And so it went, to 1914 and the innocent years between the wars, when fires were set for languid visitors and the 1930s were as gracious for a fortunate few as new hotels were elegant and spacious. Hotels and boarding houses that are still there today because change is imperceptible. And then there's Hepburn's big brother, the Highlands' only major township, Dalesford. There are a few towns in Australia so picturesque. It's perched on the sides of Wombat Hill, Mount Franklin's nearest neighboring volcano. The town was laid out in 1854 and called Wombat, which wasn't English enough then. So in 1855, it was renamed after Warren Hastings' county seat in Gloucestershire. And Dalesford is certainly a pretty enough name. For the first pastoralists, with no town in mind in the 1830s and 40s, a slush lamp in a homestead was sufficient night light in the bush. Then gold was discovered. So Dalesford was the child of a gold rush, raised in the Victorian era by serious, civic-minded parents, prosperous not just with gold, but with their own importance, who built Dalesford to match. Solid not disgraced by Bendigo or Ballarat. A church on every corner and an institute of mines in the main street. With pride went style and faith in the future and social order. Great houses glowed with gaslight and gracious living, suitably catered for with sweet decadence in town.
social gulfs were universal. Where there wasn't a church on the corner, there was a pub. For despite its civic dignity, Dalesford was a roistering, rowdy place. Today, little more than an hour from Melbourne, Dalesford is a slow, remote town, off the beaten track and not overrun by tourists, so it's a little schizophrenic about visitors. Some people like tourists, others like to preserve its privacy. It welcomes the tourists' well-rewarded dollar, but it also hoards the years of its past, shuffling them secretly with deliberate quietness, like old family stories. Nearly a third of the Victorian Central Highlands is state forest, Wombat State Forest. In its deepest reaches, the bush is the one encountered by the first pastoralists to pierce these ranges, but here, it's a rebirth. The gold seekers devastated everything in their path, and it's taken a century to regenerate. Thinly, hesitatingly, the dry body of winter returning to spring. It was here that the diggers' first onslaught fell in the ravines of Sailor's Creek as it winds just 12 kilometres from Dalesford to Hepburn. The only sounds now are water striking rock and the ripple of rapids. But let's take a walk where thousands of booted feet tramped in search of gold. This steep-sided creek flooding through the ravines was awash with gold. It was there for the taking when a handful of miners left Ballarat to chase will-o'-the-wisp rumours further north into these hidden gorges, the Jim Crow Ranges, so-called possibly because oddly shaped trees on a ridge resembled a silhouette of dancers performing a popular jig of the times, the Jim Crow. But the stream they explored was Wombat Creek, invaded first by 12 men in separate parties, including two runaway sailors who followed a tributary that became Sailor's Creek. Within weeks, the rush was on. Within a year, the creeks had become like the honeycombed ant heaps of Henry Lawson's roaring days. Yellow mounds of mullock with spots of red and white, the scattered quartz that glistened like diamonds in the light. Lawson cheerfully glosses over the real human drama, the tumult and the violence, 13 murders in as many years, the need for firearms, the chicanery, the stealing, the brawls and the drunkenness, the bravado and the banditry. They named their mining places Cockerley, Keep It Dark Gully, Brandy Hot Flat, and Don't Wake Em Up Gully. The hall was great, 24 major nuggets here in just a few years, but there were tens of thousands of miners looking for them. Germans, Danes, Welsh and Irish, Cornish, French, Italian and Chinese. One in every three was Chinese. All trying everything. It was the most diversified gold field in Victoria. Anything was a good prospect. Open cut, deep quartz, tunneling and alluvial. As late as the 1970s, an old timer was still letting himself down into these hand dug pits with finger and toe holes cut with his pick. Fossicking, full of hope. All gone now. Pale traces in the dusty haze and autumn sunshine, drained of even the hint of gold or the trace of a colour. Grand-scale Californians built water races 20 miles long to feed the water to wash their amazing American long toms and Yankee cradles. Superbly surveyed and engineered water races that fed the sluice boxes some hundreds of yards long. Water races that are today just walking tracks through the bush. For the alluvial treasure at Wombat Flats was quickly exhausted. It was hard, hard going. Mostly only narrow banks to work on. They stripped the creek to bedrock they buttressed its banks with the rocks they split. They burnt the trees and pillaged the hillsides until all was exhausted, until they were reduced to tunneling like termites and scavenging like ants. As they did here in an anonymous ravine, just one of countless hillsides pierced by shaft after shaft after shaft, to at least four more within a stone's throw of this entrance. But once inside any of them, what are they like? Just how far in do they go? Well, I'm just about to find out. Warned that because of the 
Changing conditions over the years, the temperatures and the weather, the first 50 metres could be a little bit dicey. Come on. So now I'm about 200 metres in, and this is David Endicott, the new owner of the shaft, a man who I think is more interested in history than in gold. David, what really happened in here? Well, Roger, we're standing in a pretty ancient old river bed, creek bed, or maybe even a gully. And uh, what's on top of us is basalt, volcanic rock. And the, uh, when the volcanoes erupted, it came down the old river valleys. And we have the old bedrock, which is sandstones. And then the old river gravels, they were here until the miners got to them. And the volcanic ash and the bluestone above our heads and hopefully it's going to stay up there. <laughs> but they actually uh, built these these stones up against yes. the sides well, rather than take them out? Obviously have opened out a very big cavern in here. Uh, it must have had good gold in it or they wouldn't have uh, done that work. And they uh, repacked, restacked the uh, rocks as they went and just took out the wash dirt, the gravels with the gold in it. And uh, they had a tram line in here, a wooden tram line with trolleys and they pushed them outside and put the wash dirt uh, through a puddling machine or a sluice box. Uh, we can see here now where they obviously weren't getting much. Now, from here up to here are the old creek gravels. You can, you can see them. There's small rock and sand and gravel and a bit of gold, I know, because we've had a little bit of a scratch. That's somewhere where we've had a bit of a dig. Right. But obviously it didn't have much gold in it, so they left it and they concentrated on the bits where they were getting a lot the, of gold. The uh, $64 question, how often did mines like this collapse? <laughs> Fairly regularly. There were a few fatalities around here. Um, and of course, all of them have, practically all of them, have collapsed by now just sitting there unused with the rabbits and the weather getting into them. Uh, not many are open like this one. All right, well, have a look at this, Roger. This is very interesting, this. What, what is that? It's a, uh, a charred tree. Charred tree? Yes, it's all charcoal. You can uh, we'll pick a decent piece of it out. Here's a pick. Oh, got, got it? it yeah. Good. Charred tree, how old would that be? Well, certainly more than five or ten thousand years. And why is it charred? Uh, it's charred because it was um, in, in the creek, growing in the creek, or else fallen down across the creek when the volcanoes occurred and the hot ash and the lava came over and filled in this creek valley and it just cooked the trees. Right. And if you look up the back over there, behind you, or in front of you and behind you, you'll see some uh, little roots or branches, little holes in the wall. And of course, we're in another one of those caverns. It obviously yielded good gold because they did a fair bit of work opening it out all around us. Now, to open a cavern out like this, how much work, how many days' work for a man would be involved? A lot of work. But tramping up and down these gorges, I have to admire our forebears, who regularly went on foot, laden with equipment, uphill and down dale, as they say. Today, though, the first tracks and dried-out water races are not only a walk into history, but a tonic, literally. Not just a series of middens of mullock heaps, but a tourist walk from Mineral Spring to Mineral Spring. So we trek from Sutton Springs, trying the waters, of course, to Tipperary Springs, grateful after a hard hike for the pump that refreshes. Tipperary, of course, because it was an Irish enclave. And on again, slogging on in the footsteps of men who understood that travelling meant legs. And what else were legs for but to travel from Tipperary Springs to Bryce's Flat? And from there to discover, as today's tourists do, the blowhole. Sailor's Creek meandered round a gully, dissipating the alluvial loads. 
it was inclined to flood and to pour into low-lying shafts. So the miners took their dynamite and diverted the stream, blowing a drastic hole in a granite cliff and channeling the creek the way they wanted it to go. The way nobody really wanted to go was up Breakneck Gorge. And it wasn't fanciful nonsense that called it Breakneck Gorge. Horses and men fell to their deaths. On some stretches, only a few millimetres separated the climbers from a death-dealing abyss. Much easier now, of course, but it's still mostly recommended for physical fitness fanatics, jogging freaks, <laughs> and masochists in general. Uh, although it's very tempting to take the very short few kilometer drive from Dalesford to Hepburn, I still commend the nine kilometer slog through the bush and our history. The central hallway of the old school of mines, arched and high ceilinged and Many decades later, a technical school is a corridor to history, lined with fading records but vibrant stories. A history that includes the second great wave of European migration en masse to one Australian region. In a body, the Italian-speaking Swiss from that blurred area between the extreme north of Italy and the Swiss canton of Ticino to escape the Austrian overlords of Lombardy and for riches and adventure, packed up and came to Australia, to Wombat Flat. Memorial had its origins on Sunday morning, the 30th of June, 1867. A universal scenario, but one somehow peculiarly Australian. For is there a more tragic Australian experience than that of a small child or children lost in the bush? They shall not hunger nor thirst, neither shall the heat nor sun smite them. For he that hath mercy on them shall lead them, even by the springs of water shall he guide them. June the 30th, 1867, Sunday, 9.30 a.m. William Graham, six, his brother Tom, four, and their mate Alfred Bomer, age five, were playing. The morning had been cold with a severe frost. But the day warmed, as it should for children. Sunny, a day to enjoy, a day for adventure, for a six-year-old, a five-year-old, and a child of four to romp through. Grown-up kids in a bush town, six, five, and four. <laughs> From their home by Dalesford's main street, the world around them beckoned. Wild goats to be chased and bearded miners to spy on. A ramble through their immense backyard. Yabbies in Wombat Creek, gold tailings in the mullock heaps, and secret places and daydreams. Magic spells to lead them on to the infinity of childhood through a cool, sunny morning in the Central Highlands in June 1867.
At three in the afternoon, Mr. Much, a storekeeper five kilometers from Dalesford, spied them wandering through his back paddock. They were little kids, but self-assured and confident, so he believed. He knew they had only to go on to find the telegraph wires leading back to Dalesford. And ignoring the wires, going the wrong way, they came to Specimen Hill Mine. But because it was Sunday, the mine was closed, idle, the men not there. Only a solitary farmer, John Quinn, saw them. Go back, he said. You're on the wrong track. But they smiled and went on. But when Mrs. Quinn came running, the boys had disappeared. The Quinn's property stood 10 kilometers from Dalesford and separated the cleared land of the mines from the encircling, brooding bush. A landscape lying in loving ambush for the innocent. Another continent, intact, forbidden, impenetrable, unforgiving, and old. And the children went on. The children of fairies and dreams and trust. The sky lowered and a wind whispered, nudging the day's warmth. But they went on, listening to a music no one else could hear. And the declining sun watched them hypnotically. Rain began to fall, heavy rain for a while. Then the weather lifted and a thin sun returned, pallid, shadowless and austere, overwhelmed by forest, by the dark enveloping silent bush, as cool as winter dusk. And the sun began to set and the temperature fell and a frost set in. It became cold, freezing, with no landmarks or signposts. There was just the bush calling them on. William Six, Alfred Five, and Tom Four. So they went into the night and the cold, trustingly. For three months, almost the entire town searched the surrounding bush, but the children had disappeared as completely as if they'd been at Hanging Rock. It wasn't until August that their bodies were found in the hollow trunk of a broad tree. The big boys, the six and five-year-olds, had lain down in the frost and cold at the front of the hollow tree to try to keep the four-year-old safe and warm. It didn't really matter. The bush had been waiting for them all day, spellbound. Today, Dalesford is retracing and restoring the route of the little boy's journey so that we can walk it from solitary cairn to solitary cairn and reflect. In fact, since then, as a memorial, the Duxes of Dalesford Primary School every year are given a prize bequeathed by the Graham family, a gold medal in honour of those lost three children. And this year is the 100th anniversary of that award. But the fact is that when the dampness and the cold and the bush closed in, had they known it, they were only a few hundred meters from the road home. 
Come boating on Lake Dalesford is a modern invitation, capitalizing on nostalgia. The 1920s tricked out perfectly to seduce the flight from the uncompromising 80s. But romantic Lake Dalesford was an artificial creation. A good idea in 1929, drowning a ravine. And also a Chinatown of joss houses, vegetable gardens and exhausted gold tailings. The pre-war swimmers and their stands of loyal supporters old-fashioned rows of cement benches are just as dated, part of Lake Dalesford's charm, where now swans prevail and dainty kingfishers hide in the trunks of trees and proletarian ducks parade as day-trippers swim and barbecue, picnic and fish. Lake Dalesford Book Bar. Hand hewn timbers and handmade bricks, snug with the warmth of a pot bellied stove and the comfort of old books. Old brown books and the kind, fine face of the clock forged in the veils of the fire. Content in the rare and treasured past, dreaming across the lake. The lake swarms with native redfin and cod. The introduced European trout has become a welcome native, lurking in the deep pools of Wombat Creek, now fed by the lake spillway. Is it any wonder that Dalesford was invaded by painters, potters and patricians? And that overlooking the lake is the Lake House restaurant. If the central highlands are about self-indulgence, and one's day at Dalesford is made complete at one of Victoria's finest restaurants. The lake house is surrounded by the chef's own garden, three acres of ripe-to-pick crops to provide its table with regional specialties and its owner chef, Ala Wolf Tasca, with regional secrets, while travelers wait in expectation. The meal to come will be lake house hare, pan-fried hare fillets served with creamed leeks, local mushrooms and zucchini flowers stuffed with seasoned green lentils. The mushrooms are not the product of paddocks, but a Belitis variety from the local pine forests, common in Europe. The zucchinis Ella picked in her garden this morning with the flowers in full bloom, as the shallots were freshly picked too. Finely chopped, they're for the sauce. The hair has been boned out and the slender sliced fillets have been left to marinate in red wine and light oil. Meanwhile, the sauce base, incorporating the hair bones, has been simmering for several hours with a sprig of thyme and a bay leaf, a stick of celery, red wine and an ordinary beef or poultry stock. Now the leeks, finely sliced. They'll be cooked, tossed in butter until soft. And since they're to be creamed, ultimately Allah will add a dash of cream. The zucchini flowers are then stuffed, remove the central stamen, of course, with the seasoned cooked lentils. There's no mystery about lentils, of course, but the trick is to slice the zucchinis lengthwise without disturbing the flowers. Hair portions are then pan fried quickly, one side at a time, to sear, to seal the juice and flavors in. And to be served rare as they should be, the fillets should be firm and crusty on the outside, but tender within. Sort of prodding it. To see if it's done or not. 
So the pan flames, and the kitchen is fumy with the fragrance of thyme and seasoning and mushroom and game meat sizzling on the stove. The lightly done meat is then removed but kept warm, while a little of the sauce base is poured into the pan to deglaze any hair sediments. And next, the rest of the sauce base. I've just got to cook this to reduce it. And once it's reduced down to a glaze, I'll just add the, um, the butter pieces to thicken it. And then that's served over the top of the hair. So add the butter. This is to finish off making this the actual sauce for the hair. With the addition of 100 grams of cold butter, and it must be cold and whisked so the butter doesn't separate, the sauce base becomes a sauce when it reduces by half. The zucchinis may be either cooked in a trace of butter or steamed. Finally, all is ready to be brought together. As well as the hair, the creamed leeks and the zucchinis, Ala Wolf Tasker has prepared very light potato galettes to accompany them. The whole is a culmination of a series of steps towards perfection by a master chef absorbed under pressure with timing and harmony. The harmony achieved when today's specialty of the house is born to the table, a superb cuisine of subtle contrast but unity, flamboyant in flavor, yet as discreetly subdued as the restaurant, but presented with a flourish and accompanied by a sophisticated regional red. In every respect, an indigenous Central Highlands homegrown repast. Together, over a specifically local cheese plate to make Europe envious, a meal to recount, to reflect on and to savour, to yarn about as the light pales and fades, because the sun is setting, as nobly coloured as the wine. volcanoes roared. Could there have been Aborigines or their predecessors present? Impossible, you say. Then strange are the ways of their dreaming. Part of their legend, their dream time, their folklore and their religion seems to be nothing more than a documented account of the volcanoes. 300,000 years ago? If there are many survivors of the Jojoborong people, some of them might just know the old stories, but the clans were soon broken up and moved on from Franklin Ford to alien places. So what did the dream say? Long, long ago, when this whole country was one immense mountain, ruled over by the eagle, the crow and the bat, the two birds quarrelled, and the crow went away. When he came back, he brought with him fire, and he set the eagle's domain ablaze. And from that fire, one mountain became many, and the highlands were transformed into hills and plains and valleys. But there's more to it. There's also a story 
about a feud. It was recorded by the first protector of Aborigines in the 1840s. There in the distance is Mount Tarangar, eons older than Mount Franklin. Franklin, a brash young pup, was determined to challenge Tarangar. So it fired salvos of stones at Tarangar, but the missiles fell short by about 20 kilometers and formed a pile of rocks, which as geologists tell us is quite correct. It's a pile of volcanic rocks flung from Mount Franklin hundreds of thousands of years ago. A one old black man in the 1840s told the first white settlers round here that his father, or so he called him, remembered Mount Franklin when smoke and lava still issued from its crater. Could that really be so? But in our memory, all the dark people were rounded up. The Loddon River tribes, the settlers labeled them, and brought to this broad, pleasant basin, this happy valley, for food, shelter, clothing, Christianity, education, and salvation. It was an earnest, loving mission of hope and charity, a waiting room outside the foyer to extinction. There was kindness, tolerance, and sympathy, four-walled huts, stew, and tea, and chapel once a day. And all the people who stayed died. The eagle, the crow, and the bat were no more. Tarangar and Franklin had long, long ceased to erupt. And the white man moved over the land, a conqueror, vanquishing and remaking and renaming, exulting in the beauty of his new domain, discovering for him for the first time. Hanging Rock and Wombat Flats and Mount Franklin and Breakneck Gorge and the astonishing waters from the heart of the volcanoes. Discovering for him for the first time the gold and the soil and the prosperity. Tracks through a wilderness we call the Central Highlands of Victoria. But his coming was a permanent presence, preserved in Wood End and Kyneton and Malden and in the spa baths at Hepburn and the lovely town of Dalesford, Wombat Hill, the last of the volcanoes. And we were so rich then, in the golden days, we could crown its crest with the self-indulgence and beauty of a rare botanic park, an exotic garden of other hemispheres, winding and wrapping the sides of the mountain, a summary of all the world's gardens, so that when we breasted its heights, we could inspect another all around us, as far as the eye can see.